All right, well, we've got lots of ground to cover and a really interesting talk today. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NAGT webinar. The NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Webinars in the series feature novel and innovative work in earth education research and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people like you. The NAGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join the discussion. On the screen is a link to the webinar series where you can find the schedule, an archive of past events, and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can find slides, resources, and recordings of each webinar, including today's, through the webinar archives. Before we get started, please take a look at the Zoom controls that are currently on the screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and cameras off. If you have questions or comments along the way, we encourage you to enter those into the chat box. To find that, find the Zoom control bar and click on the chat button. Webinar presenters and staff will be monitoring that chat. A reminder to all participants that it, that in all NAGT meetings and events, uh, participants are expected to abide by the NAGT code of conduct, which applies in all venues, events, and online forums associated with NAGT. Please read the NAGT code of conduct policy, which I'll link to in the chat momentarily for any details. Today's webinar is titled Running Online Inter Internship Programs, Successes and Challenges, and it's presented by Kelsey Russo-Nixon from UNAVCO. This webinar will overview challenges encountered, successes achieved, and lessons learned in three UNAVCO in internship programs that were held online this summer. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Kelsey, for being here, and I'll turn things over to you. Great. Thank you, Mitch. Just give me a minute to share my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, wonderful. So as Mitch said, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, running online internship programs and the successes and challenges observed, at least um, from our perspective this summer. Um, I am uh, Kelsey Russo-Nixon and I work for UNAVCO on the education and community engagement team and I manage the Geo Launchpad internship program. Um, I also want to recognize uh, my former colleague, Andy Ellis, um, who managed the Recess and USIP uh, programs this year. She's moved on, but her, um, her help this year or her management was a huge uh, part. And so we have to, of course, acknowledge her as well. Um, and before we get started, I am curious uh, as to what brings you um, here, what your interest was um, in this webinar today. And so I think Mitch is going to launch a poll. Um, and what reason kind of best describes uh, your participation today? Awesome. So a lot of people managing internship programs, which is awesome. So I hope that you'll find some of this stuff useful, especially if we have to adopt some sort of virtual or hybrid model for next summer. Um, so thanks for participating in that. And now I'm going to lose my, there we go. Um, so Sorry, we advanced a little quickly there. So a little, just a little background on UNAVCO and the GAGE facility. So um, UNAVCO is a nonprofit organization. We're governed by a number of universities. Um, it's a more of a consortium. Our, our uh, uh, funding is primarily, comes from the National Science Foundation and we are providing support to the geodetic community through the GAGE facility. Um, and we have a long history of leading and running student research internship programs with um, a big focus on increasing diversity in the earth sciences. 
excuse me. So different from most universities, um, UNAVCO has a uh, ECE program, dedicated staff um, who uh, spend a lot of time on the workforce initiative, um, and which includes these three summer internship programs. And so in the beginning, we were pretty confident that we had the resources and expertise to transition our programs to an online uh, format successfully. Um, Geo Workforce at UNAVCO, so there's a figure in front of you here. Um, we have three different internship programs. They each run 11 weeks long. Um, they're, they're one big cohort, but they're also a mix of three sub cohorts. And so um, they each provide unique opportunities and um, from students from underrepresented populations um, the, with the goal to develop their technical and communication skills. And then of course, to broaden participation in the earth sciences. Um, and so we strive to support students from in early early in their education through really through their early career, um, starting with the Geo Launchpad program. Um, Geo Launchpad is aimed at lower division undergraduates, and we recruit from community colleges in Colorado and New Mexico. Um, Recess is aimed for upper division upper division undergraduates. Um, that program has been running since 2005, so we've had 17 summers of Recess interns, which is pretty incredible. Um, and then our UNAVCO student internship program or USIP. Um, actually, we've had interns going back as far as 1998, but the program didn't formalize until 2015. And so it's been a formal program for the past six years. And that program um, brings in graduate students and post doc early career um, to do UNAVCO um, related work. And so, as I mentioned, um, the Geo Launchpad program is um, community college students from Colorado, New Mexico. It's um, we refer to it uh, as a pre REU. So REU being research experience for undergraduates. Um, these students are not necessarily doing, doing research. It's more of a research support. Um, and so we're developing their research ready skills. Um, they're offered a weekly stipend, um, housing, which is optional since they're local. Um, and this year we had four students participate um, from that program. Recess is upper level undergraduates um, aimed at increasing uh, um, participation from underrepresented groups in geoscience. They do a, a scientific research experience, so a research um, project. They're also getting a weekly stipend, housing. Um, they are recruited nationally, so they um, we cover their travel to and from Boulder, where UNAPCO is located, um, and then the conference support. And this year we had six first year students, and I know first year because recess is actually a two year program. Um, and then USIP is typically upper level undergraduates or graduate students. It's more of a work experience. Um, they're working with UNAVCO staff um, supporting the work that we do here. And this year they, there was two students. And so we had a cohort of 12 um, students, which was actually on the smaller side compared to previous years, but that was not anything COVID related. Um, just happened to work that way out with funding and resources and things. But um, we had we always have this unique balance of supporting a whole cohort, but also um, these sub cohorts and these different programs that each have um, different components. And so I understand that most people aren't running three different internship programs, um, but we hope that through these three, you'll find um, some insights and experience that you can pull from for your own programs. So a typical program year, this is basically what we were planning for. Um, we have 12 to 20 students participate in the three different internship programs in Boulder. Um, the Recess and Geo Launchpad students live in dorms on the CU Boulder campus and share rooms. Um, we do multiple field trips and team building, cohort building activities throughout the summer, um, especially since they typically are gone four days a week doing their project work. So it's, it's really nice to bring them back um, together from time to time, especially throughout the summer to see where they are and just get that kind of like near peer mentoring experience. Um, the recess interns uh, typically conduct separate research projects. The Geo Launchpad students work in pairs and then everyone comes together um, for a weekly professional development workshops. And then recess and Geo Launchpad interns present their projects at a local poster symposium and then at a national conference in the fall. However, March 2020 comes and we accept 12 students from all over the country into our programs and then COVID really takes off. Um, so I'm curious before we go into what we did, um, if you were managing an internship program this summer, what did you do or what do you think you would have done um, in our situation?
Awesome, great. Thank you for your feedback. It's good to kind of know where everyone was um, in this in this summer. And so <laughs> this is what our 2020 program looks like. Um, instead of students participate, participating in Boulder, we were still able to keep all of our students. Um, they participated in the programs, but just not in Boulder, of course. Um, so there's no travel. Um, the recess and geolaunch pet students did not live in dorms, so there was very limited um, interaction. Uh, no field trips, obviously, so no, you know, it was harder for students to get to know um, us as program staff, get to know their mentors. Typically, we invite all of the mentors on a field trip at some point, um, invite UNAVCO staff um, because they love to be here and be involved with the students. Um, our president has come up quite a few times, our former president. Um, and so th that was out, but we were still able to foster some team building and cohort activities. Um, the the uh, recess interns, instead of conducting separate research projects, they worked um, in pairs this year. Uh, Geo Launchpad worked in pairs as is typical, um, but we felt like the recess um, interns might benefit from having someone else on their side um, this summer instead of being kind of alone in their own research this summer. And then we still all came together for our weekly professional development workshops. Um, and then this year, of course, there was no local poster symposium. Um, we're really blessed in Boulder in that we have so many um, scientific institutions around us and um, a lot of different internship programs. So typically we um, kind of combine forces and we do a big po local poster symposium with over like 60, sometimes 70 students who participate. Um, so of course that did not happen this year. Um, and uh, the students are presenting at national conferences, but you know, they're all virtual. So that didn't uh, didn't quite come to life this year. I don't know why that keeps happening. So um, our motivation for going remote, um, we, we had already um, made these commitments to the students, right? We had 12 students who accepted positions. Um, we had project mentors lined up. Um, and so we really felt that we wanted to keep that commitment for our students just to make sure that they had access to their education and career advancement, um, monetary stipends, of course, and the community connection. Um, many of our students come from lower socio uh, socioeconomic um, backgrounds. And so um, they rely on these programs really for not only to advance their career, but for some summer income. And then especially for this year, you know, students uh, might have lost their jobs or parents, whoever, you know, caregivers might have lost their jobs. And so it was, I, we felt like it was important that they still had that sort of um, monetary support. Um, our external evaluator found that 60% of our students this year um, received a Pell Grant and actually 83% of the recess students did. Um, and so um, we were we just really wanted to stay committed to them. Um, and then we also had 100% buy in from the National Science Foundation. So um, they were they backed us up and we're like, hey, if you're going to do this, go for it. We support you. Um, and so that was huge for us. And so we were like, OK, let's do this. Um, so a quick timeline of activity. So early March, we accept 12 students into the internship positions. Um, I have a map here of where all the students worked from, from their home locations. So they were definitely spread out across, across the map, different time zones. Um, by mid-March, uh, the UNAPCO facility closed um, along with most of the rest of the country. Um, and at that point, we let, uh, we let the students know that we were gonna move to a remote format. We didn't have a lot of information on that or what that was going to look like at the time, but we let them know that we were gonna um, see our commitment through and so by late March, um, we started figuring out how we were going to do this. And so we hired an online learning consultant to help us transition all the professional development materials um, online. Um, and so you'll see that from early in March to late March, a lot of decisions were made and it was a very short timeline and we just didn't have um, enough time to really plan this or to research um, our own communication tools or different things that we could um, kind of teach ourselves how to do. And so this online learning consultant really helped us make that transition. Um, we had already had a team building um, uh, consultant. We had a program evaluator and a writing workshop instructor so we did just to get their remote commitment through there. And then starting in April is when we um, really started uh, looking at the support structures that interns were gonna need this summer. And so we sent a survey out to kind of gauge where they were um, for the summer. Um, we, based off of that, those results, we ended 
ended up offering a support stipend to all the interns and some mentors. Um, and I have some more information on this in, later in the, in the presentation. And then, of course, we had to meet with the project mentors, share our plans, get their feedback, and just make sure that they were um, on board. Um, and then we facilitated a mentor training with the idea that the theme of the year was flexibility, right? Um, as I said, we had a very short timeline, so that meant um, minimal planning. We were, um, throughout the summer, just constantly assessing and adapting and listening to the students and really trying to incorporate their feedback throughout the summer, which ultimately meant adjusting on the fly. This is only 11 weeks, right? Um, and so there was a, a, you know, because of the time zones and different calendars and technology issues, um, it really led to most deadlines being very flexible um, and, you know, less hard deadlines and just more, more support for the students. Um, so early May, we ship computers to interns, the support stipends go out, interns get their Zoom accounts, um, and they, they get their program guides. Um, the program ran from May 18th to July 31st. They completed their projects, participated in professional development. Towards um, the end of the summer, they began submitting abstracts to conferences. Um, late July, or really the last week of the program, the recess students presented their research projects in a colloquium, online colloquium style. Um, that uh, we had participants from UNAF, UNAFCO staff, the um, NSF and faculty from over 100 different universities participated in that. Um, and then the following day, all of the interns did um, a virtual poster session. And then this fall, um, we have interns presenting nationally. In fact, one just um, did at ACES and then the rest are presenting at G GSA or AGU. Hey, Kelsey, um, yes. uh, I was thought it might be timely to address a couple questions in the chat box, if you don't mind. Sure. So one is when in person do you normally facilitate, I think it's the professional development sessions, or is that normally a hired consultant? Um, and so you hired a different type of consultant, so they could be specifically for online. So yeah, I guess re regarding that consultant. Sure. Okay. So I think I understand the question. So typically we, um, all the professional development is done in house. Um, we, ha we do, um, rely on, we rely on a lot of resources from the university of Colorado Boulder. And so we, we sometimes get graduate students who help facilitate those, um, those, uh, kind of workshops and communication seminars. But this year we hired, um, an online learning consultant just to help us prep in the beginning. They didn't actually do the teaching. They just showed us, um, some helpful resources and tools and things that we could use along the way. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Yes, that's great. And were there others? Um, well, there was someone interested in becoming a mentor and I'll just type that answer for her. She can contact us. Okay, awesome, thanks. Okay, so um, timely since um, these are some of the tools that we worked through with the online learning consultant. Um, and so UNAFCO had business accounts um, with Google, Zoom, and Slack. Um, Slack we picked up um, when we all went to working from home. And so um, it kind of made that an easy transition. Um, I think most universities, if you're running a research um, experience that you would probably lean on your own you know, learning management system uh, but we used Google Classroom. It was the central location for all the professional development because it has a calendar. We had um, uploaded the syllabus to that. It assigned, um, uh, tracked assignments and went week by week. We could, everything got put into there and it was ready to go um, as soon as the intern started. Um, and so that, and it's a free tool, which is pretty great. Um, you do need a Google account, which we learned that you don't necessarily need a Gmail to use that. You just have to register whatever email address you use um, as a Google account. So that was a slight hurdle to get over um, in the summer just to make sure since most students use their institution emails um, just to make sure that they um, had access, but that went pretty well. Um, we used Zoom a lot. Um, each intern had their own account and so that way they could schedule meetings with their partner, with their mentors, um, with their, you know, with, with anyone else really. It was, a, it was a personal Zoom for them to use for the summer. Um, we used breakout rooms um, to kind of simulate small group discussions while like hoping simultaneously to, to keep um, on the theme of cohort building. Um, we actually, one of the things that um, we received feedback was pretty early as the interns you know, didn't necessarily feel super comfortable in a group environment to share so much about themselves. And they thought maybe having more smaller group discussions would help with that. And so, 
um, Andy and I started asking like kind of a question of the week or started each communication seminar session with a question that was informal and fun. And then the intern, we would randomly um, separate the interns into small groups and let them, you know, have their own discussions, get to know each other for, you know, five to 10 minutes. Um, and then we used polls, of course, just like we're doing now to keep it interactive and keep everyone engaged. Um, and then just kind of gauge everyone's experience and interest on the different topics um, of that week. And then Slack was really helpful as um, as far as like infor, um, informal discussions go. And we used it for different announcements when emails weren't necessary. Um, students were getting bombarded with emails. And so Slack was an easy way to just share information um, somewhat informally. Um, it helped, we, we'd hoped it was gonna help with cohort building. Um, we had several channels to keep students um, kind of more fun and engaged. So we, we had like a pets channel where students uploaded pictures and fun facts about their pets or um, an art channel. Someone asked if we could have a creativity channel and people shared recipes and different art they were doing. And so it was a way for them to hopefully like get to know each other, maybe a little bit of near peer mentoring sprinkled along the way um, and kind of simulate those hallway conversations that they were going to miss out on this summer. Um, and then we always had a weekly assignment each week, um, usually a fun topic, but just to kind of make sure everyone stayed on board because not, not everyone participated as much as we had hoped on Slack, um, but I'll get, I actually will get more into that um, along the way. So this is from our um, external evaluation. And so some of the findings that she had on the, um, how effective these tools were. Um, and for the most part, the students found them effective, um, especially having the calendar and Zoom, those were big calendar to keep them, everybody on track and then Zoom so they could um, engage when they needed to, the Google Classroom. And then um, Slack got, was actually a little bit less rated than the others, which um, kind of surprised us. Um, Cause even though most of the comments on the evaluation were positive. Um, it's, I think that not everyone is comfortable using systems like that. And so um, that was just kind of an interesting find. But one quote I pulled from the evaluation here is that um, the interns also valued the informal channels on Slack, allowed them to have fun and get to know one another. Um, and then several interns commented on the creation of the global social change channel and how that was important to them, which um, will lead nicely into my next slide. And so, of course, there's lots going on in the world. Um, and then the, the Black Lives Matter movement really accelerated um, kind of right at the beginning of our program. And so we were um, left with this question of how, how do we support our students in such, you know, in, the, in, this, in this time. Um, the RESIS program in particular is dedicated to supporting students from underrepresented groups, including many Black students. And so, our um, program staff and I, um, we decided that it was best to acknowledge the movement, um, make sure the, the students were um, heard and continually supported. Um, one of our communication seminars, we um, observed in a silence of eight minutes and 46 seconds to have some self-reflection, You know, told the students they could use that time to educate themselves on what was going on in the country. Um, we just really wanted to make sure that we understood their feelings and their needs. Um, and so we established this global social cha change channel. And really, I think it was probably the most popular channel from there on, on Slack. Um, and this was a channel where um, students could share their um, conversations or in history and just kind of experiences with it. And it actually evolved from um, not just Black Lives Matter, but a, um, we had a student who, an indigenous student and who was, um, open enough to share um, some of the things that her people deal with. And so it was just, it turned into just a really um, positive but realistic kind of um, conversations and, and where students could kind of share their thoughts and findings and news articles um, and other resources. And then UNAVCO staff encouraged um, the leadership here to make a statement to the community. We felt like that was important to our interns to, to see that um, UNAVCO supported them. So optional chat box discussion if people feel inclined how did students in your community react and um, how did you support them i'm curious to know then of course we're also in a virus pandemic and so again how do we support our students um, really we we felt the only thing we could do is have a plan in case a student became ill or they had to become a caregiver to someone who became ill 
Um, we did weekly individual check-ins, and so that was an opportunity, one-on-one -on -one time to make sure that they were doing okay. Um, we had daily online survey check-ins that they filled out um, through Google Forms, but really we purposely did not integrate it too much into the program. Um, we felt like this program might be a nice distraction from it all, and um, so we didn't want to focus too much on the virus pandemic, and everyone stayed healthy, and so we're really grateful for that. So for those of you who run internship programs, you know that the, uh, the pre-summer planning up to that is, is a lot of work. Um, and this summer felt like it was even more difficult, right? We were faced with so many different, um, we had to change so much, right? And so um, what, you know, we didn't know our students. And so what we did is we sent out a support survey to kind of gauge where the students were. And I have, um, the, on the next slide, some of the questions that we asked and the insights that we received, but because from what we found, we decided that we were going to offer the students a support stipend, a one-time um, pretty substantial amount of $2,500. And um, the reason for this was that, you know, again, we were on such a short timeline. We couldn't really fully assess each student's needs. And so we decided that just a flat amount would be best and they could use that money to um, up their internet bandwidth or um, purchase a desk, a chair. Um, you know, some of them might've lost their jobs. Um, and so we felt like the cost savings of not um, paying for the students to travel to Boulder and also their housing, um, we felt like we had, you know, we needed to provi provide a one more level of support. And so um, we decided to do that. Um, and then we also did some introductory webinars, which we typically don't always do in the summer. And so this was a way um, to get everyone together, put, you know, names to faces um, for everyone to kind of get to know each other and to go over, eliminated the so many emails. I mean, things were changing on the fly, right? And so many decisions were being made so quickly. And so instead of sending an email to the group, every time, you know, we tried, we did um, one or two introductory webinars, depending on the program, uh, to get students acquainted. And then some of the resources, the computers, the Zoom accounts, I listed introductory webinars here on purpose again, because that was a resource of information for them. And then um, their program guides. And so the program guides just really have a lot of, um, you know, the logistics, the program expectations and things um, so that they had some clear ideas before the program started. Um, and so the survey, um, these are just a select few of the questions, but we asked them to describe where they were planning to do their work this summer. Were they going to be in their bedroom? Were they going to be at a kitchen table at home? Um, do they have a desk and chair to work with? Um, what kind of internet access will they have? Are they relying on a mobile hotspot? Do they have Wi-Fi, et cetera? Um, what additional resources do you think you might need? Um, that was an optional question, but a lot of students um, provided answers and most, mostly they were just worried about having enough support um, in a virtual environment versus an in-person environment. Um, what do you fear will be the most challenging for you? A lot of them were worried they wouldn't be able to stay focused. Um, what are you most hoping to gain? Um, most people really want to gain their networking skills and learn about careers, um, you know, and, and really get to complete some real research. Um, we have any added responsibilities. So are you going to be a caregiver for someone? Um, or did you have to pick up a job that now you might not be available during, you know, business hours? Um, and then they had a space to share any additional comments or concerns because obviously everyone's unique, needs are unique. And so um, this really helped us kind of gauge where our students were and get to know them a little bit better and how we could, you know, and then use that to plan to support them. Yeah, I think there's a question, um, uh, Kelsey, about the logistics of the hardware software purchases. I think they were wondering if the computers were given or loaned. Yes, so the computers were loaned. Um, so we typically in a year would provide the students with um, computers. And so we um, this year had to ship them all out. And then we included like headphones, um, I think a, like a laptop cover, computer case, and then um, a, a return shipping label and so that they could return it at the end of the summer. And so they got their computer, I think it was like the Thursday or Friday before their internship started on Monday. And then they had a week to return it to us. Okay, so mentor training. Um, we typically do mentor training each year, um, but this year it was definitely focused on um, preparing to support them, the students remotely. Um, and so 
this involved all program staff, um, their project mentors. Um, Recess also has communication mentors who help them write their research paper, a writing instructor who leads that process, and a graduate assistant who's um, a, usually typically a grad, a grad student from the University of Colorado Boulder. And uh, so it covers program logistics, of course. Um, we provide a mentor mentoring program guide, um, but the main focus was really to ensure student mental health and their success in the program. And so a lot of it was a discussion about identifying different areas of weakness that we might encounter in an online format, and then strategies to overcome those challenges. Um, typically the mentors serve as volunteers, but this year we provided them a stipend um, just to accommodate the shift um, in work scope of their projects. Um, and then we highlighted all the best communication practices, let them know the different tools we were gonna be using, um, more of a focus on the whole student mentoring or intentional mentoring, and then um, clear program goals and expectations. And then we added them to the Slack channel so that they could um, participate informally with their students as well. Um, and then if you use Slack or if you're familiar with Slack, it allows you to direct message. And again, so like when an email isn't necessary, it was nice to have that option. Okay, and so a typical week this summer. So um, I mentioned that a big part of this program is professional development for all three programs. Um, and so Recess had a writing workshop for two hours. I will mention also, typically the professional development is all done on one day. Um, and so when they're in person, they would come to UNAVCO or sometimes we've hosted it on the campus um, at University of Colorado Boulder, but um, it would be a full day of writing workshop you know, then we over lunch, we'd have the geoscience career circle and then the communication seminars or some version of that all in one day. And then the other four days are spent um, working on their projects. Um, so this day we have to avoid Zoom fatigue. Um, we spread it out over over the week. And so those were the that was this is the schedule that we followed um, writing workshop for recess on Mondays. Everyone came together for a communication seminar on Wednesdays, and then everyone also participated in the geoscience career circles. Um, we established some core working hours kind of to, to accommodate all the different time zones um, that were uh, roughly 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. mountain time. Our programs are typically designed for full time, and so the students are um, expected to work around eight hours a day. I don't think that that was the case this year. It's just, it's, it's very hard to be on a computer for eight hours a day, um, especially at home with so many distractions and things. So um, again, flexibility. Um, and then uh, check-ins. And so as program managers, we met with the interns um, individually um, each week for a check-in. And this was a chance for them to express any kind of concerns or feedback or things they didn't really feel comfortable doing in a group setting. That's something that we do in person as well. Um, and then we had the daily online survey that I mentioned earlier for check-ins um, that was conducted through Google Forms. Um, we got feedback that that was actually a little overwhelming. It was like too much work for them. Um, and so we modified it to a semi-weekly um, semi -weekly thing instead. And um, I think in the future, if we were to do that again, <laughs> maybe shake the questions up a little bit. They were kind of filling out the same form every day, which I think was just felt redundant. Okay, so during the so geoscience career circles, that was a big success for us this summer. It's actually, um, it's rated very highly in person as well. It's a big part of the program. And so um, these are brown bag lunch style informal conversations with a professional. Um, and we um, try to focus on different sectors of geoscience. And so we typically bring in someone from an industry background, from a research or academia background, government, like we had someone from the EPA, um, nonprofit consulting. Um, and so this year we had the opportunity to invite guest speakers from all over the country. We weren't just limited to people who happened to be around the Boulder, Denver area. Um, and so this allowed for a lot more representation, right? Like we could really find guests that our students could see themselves in, right? And so. And it also gave us the opportunity to bring back former interns. And so we, this year, had um, two different USIP interns, uh, former USIP interns uh, speak to the students, um, and one former recess intern speak to the students. And so, and these were, um, all of these students were um, from underrepresented groups, these speakers, right? And so it just really um, gave the students, um, uh, um, I guess, confidence or, um, um, I'm blanking on the word, but they, it was, uh, 
because they saw themselves in these in these people, if that makes sense. Um, and so there was a little bit more of a near peer mentoring aspect to it. Um, there weren't really any noticeable changes versus the in-person sessions. I was a little worried that students might not be as engaged or have as many just, you know, questions and things. And um, they really, they were fantastic. Um, and so I think that we would definitely adopt a hybrid um, version of this um, in the future if we were to go back to in-person, like have some in-person and some online because it really, it worked really well. So the final presentations. Um, so the recess colloquium, because they um, they because the research, research, recess interns did their research in pairs, um, they gave their talks um, together, and so that was a new that was new for this year, um, and that was separate just for recess. And then we had the virtual poster session, which was um, recess and geo launch pad, and for that we recruited um, volunteer poster evaluators and um, actually came up with a pretty easy way again through Google Forms to have um, the posters evaluated, and we shared that feedback with the interns. Um, the students, we had trouble really finding a format that would work. And so we decided that the students would give three to five minute lightning talk style uh, poster presentations. And then we did breakout sessions after all the presentations were over to allow for um, questions. And so we actually had separate um, Zoom rooms um, for each intern pair. And then the guests were given the links and passwords for each room. Um, and this was to try our best to simulate in-person smaller group discussion, um, poster discussions. Um, it really ended up a little clunky. Um, the passwords were lost, people couldn't access the rooms, we were like trying to help everybody on the fly. Um, we had like 60, over 60 people attend the um, presentations, but then probably only 20 or so made it to the actual breakout room. So if we were to have to do this remotely again next year, we would rethink this process. And actually, I'd be really curious to know, this isn't a poll, but if anyone has, um, could share a success story of um, final presentations done in a virtual format, I think that would be, be really great for us to know and for everyone else on the call to know as well. So a summary here, what worked well, what didn't, um, some of the challenges. So we um, we partnered with the, we partner with the United States Geological Survey um, for Geo Launchpad specifically. They do, they typically do their projects with staff there. Um, we had a we had a lot of hurdles getting them the proper security clearance and getting their laptops. In fact, one group, one intern pair um, didn't even get their security clearance until two two weeks before the program ended. And luckily the project mentors were able to modify their their project a little bit but that was that was really hard and a big challenge for us um, and so working with partner organizations in a remote environment could be challenging um, of course we were relying on technology so we had a number of zoom fails we started calling them um, technology glitches people for some reason like couldn't get their microphones to work sometimes um, we do informational interviews as part of, part of the professional development. And typically we ask the students to go find someone on their own and, and kind of you know learn how to initiate that conversation and how to find someone that they might be interested in talking to. And you know, this year they weren't in labs and they weren't in offices or where they, you know, people were readily available. So this year we um, we found, we found, we identified uh, potential um, interviewees and then shared that contact information with the students and they had an option to use the person we found or um, find their own and I think in most all I think all the students ended up um, going with the person that we found but so it, it was a little bit challenging it ended up working out but it wasn't they didn't get quite the same experience um, the cohort connections still lacked unfortunately came out a lot in the external evaluation um, People had wished that they had just gotten to get, it had been able to get to know each other a little bit more. Um, and then the poster session just didn't quite go as well as we had hoped. Um, successes, the career circles worked great. Having the former interns come as career circle guests was great, but we also had them serve as informational interviewee people. Um, and they also, all of the recess communication mentors were former recess interns this year, which has never happened before. And that was really great because not only did the students have someone um, to support to support their um, writing, this was someone who had participated in recess before. And so it was just a little bit more of an insight into the program. Um, so we would possibly adopt the um, hybrid method for including second year recess students in the professional development. They typically don't participate if they come back for a second year because they um, 
they, as a second year student, are able to choose where to do their research. They don't come to Boulder. They typically find a university um, somewhere else in the country and they adopt it, they work there. So this would be a way to like keep them a little bit more engaged. Um, we had some guest speakers come to help with the professional development as well. So um, we had um, Beth Bartel, who formerly worked for UNAPCO and Wendy Bowen from IRIS one week who led professional networking and virtual presence um, online. And, and that was, you know, at least helped lift a little bit weight off of our shoulders. So that's something that I would recommend. Um, Online communication worked pretty well. Um, for the most part, we were able to, to keep in touch with everybody and uh, the tools worked, so that was great. And then um, mentoring support. And so it came out in the external evaluation that the students felt 100% supported, which was a huge win because that was our biggest concern was how do we support students in an, in an online environment? And so before we get into the outcomes and the data, I was wondering if everyone could share via a poll what they feel are the most important skills a student can gain from an internship. And we actually have three polls. <laughs> so the next one will be, where do you think the interns gain the most um, in this online internship? And where do you think that they gain the least? And I, th I think if I'm understanding question two and three specifically, that's like, how do you think it went this summer if you were going to make a prediction and then um, correct, you'll, you'll yeah. share some sort of information on, you know, so regarding question two and three, it's sort of like, if you had to guess. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Okay, interesting. So most important skill a student can gain from an internship, collaboration and networking, I would agree with that, but a pretty close second technical skills. Who do you think interns gain the most this summer? Collaboration and networking, the least technical skills. Okay, great. Thank you for your guesses. I appreciate that. Um, and so, um, this year, so these are overall, um, out of all of the interns, um, their professional and scientific gains, um, and they're ranked from the most gained to the least gained. Um, and so their career knowledge was, was what they gained the most in, um, and their technical skills um, was second. Um, least uh, amount of gains were in organization skills, um, intellectual gains, and career interest. Typically, we don't see a lot of gaining um, in the career interest, a lot of the students come kind of knowing where they want to see their career. Um, and so it doesn't always shift too much um, after completing the program. Um, but however, it's good to know. So so the career knowledge is where we saw um, the most. So interns awareness and their awareness of career resources rose from 50% to 100%. Um, they stated that the career circles were the most effective in building um, their knowledge about career options. Um, Previously in in-person internships, um, technical skills and ability to use major instrumentation were the most prominent gains. Um, we can see on the next slide, technical skills um, was actually the second most um, for you know a lot of different reasons. We're in a virtual format. No one got no one really had their hands on different tools and instrumentation um, to use this summer, and so. Um, 
and, you know, and it's good to note too, that there's a lot of differences between the three programs. So for example, like USIP um, interns who are typically um, higher in their education come in with a little bit more experience. And so we don't see that they gain a lot. Um, expect this year, 100% of USIP interns entered the internship with awareness of the major tools in their discipline, um, while only 30% of the recess in GL Launchpad did. And so, um, the recess and geolaunch pad awareness of major technical tools in their discipline rose from 30% to 83%. Okay, and so um, UNAVCO's takeaways. I think that we would continue implementing remote guests for career circles. Um, we would like to engage second year recess interns remotely um, more now that we um, feel more comfortable with the online communication tools and feel more comfortable with Zoom. Um, Former interns can continue serving as remote communication mentors, as career circle guests, and as informational interview options. As pictured here, this is on the left is um, an intern from Geo Launchpad intern from 2016, and on the right is Sean, who participated in 2020. And um, they both uh, happen to be Air Force veterans, and so um, they uh, they had a really great informational interview. And then supporting mental health is super important. Um, I think that's important. That goes for whether you're uh, running in, in person or a virtual uh, program this summer. So the pros and cons. So pros, no geographic constraints, right? Anyone could participate from anywhere. However, we were had no in-person interactions, right? No field trips, no dorm rooms, no lab partners, conferences that um, spontaneous kind of networking just didn't happen as um, in, an, in a virtual environment. Staff at UNAVCO weren't able to interact as much as they usually do with the students um, this year. Um, another pro, the scattered shorter professional development when it was how scattered throughout the week meant more frequent student check-ins. So maybe, you know, is that better than um, having them only here in person on one day a week to do the professional development? You know, we're not sure, but um, the another con possible partner organization difficulties. Um, another con the virtual final presentations were more challenging. Um, this can be a pro depending on your program, but we did notice the cost per student um, was for us either equal or less. We don't have the exact amount, but um, because we offered the support stipends and, and different um, things to kind of make up for the lack of um, costs in housing and travel. Um, but there, there's a possibility that your internship program could cost less if you're doing it online. So advice for future um, implementation, you're somewhat key to access. So these are right out of our um, evaluation. And so um, advice from the mentors that participated were to um, definitely do frequent check-ins and that video meetings were essential. Um, flexibility, of course, um, but they specifically said flexibility in project design and tasks. And um, one example that I'd like to pull out was um, someone um, said to try to create several different versions of the project plan in advance. So like an ambitious plan, a moderate plan, and a conservative plan in terms of like progress and scope so that if you have to dial back, um, you know, you have a plan in place already. Um, and then increased importance of being supportive and understanding to the interns. Um, this is advice from the interns. They really wanted more social get to know you activities. It definitely came out in the evaluation that they just didn't really get to know each other as much as they had hoped. Um, they wanted some suggestions they had were to do virtual game nights or some sort of like student friendly happy hour um, and actually let them organize those um, instead so that there's a little bit more buy in. Um, they also craved more opportunities to be able to work, you know, shoulder to shoulder um, with each other. So maybe more structured opportunities for peer learning or scientific engagement with their peers um, could be kind of built into the program. Some students um, wish they had an earlier introduction to their projects, felt like things kind of started slowly and they, they would have appreciated getting up to speed a little bit quicker. Um, and a lot of them, this is, has not been reported in the past program evaluations, but this year, um, a lot of them felt like they didn't have um, the time management organization skills to be as successful as they had hoped. So integrating um, some more of that into the professional development, um, they would have appreciated that. And so last poll, um, if you're running an, in, oh, did I hear something? Beth, okay. If you're running an internship in, in the summer of 2021 next year, what's your plan if you have one? 
and we can go ahead and launch the poll. Um, and then just as an FYI, our applications are going to open in mid-November and we're hoping to make a decision of remote or not by March 1st, but we will run the programs. So great, yeah, still waiting to see where we're gonna be at. Things are so up in the air. So again, flexibility and just waiting to figure it out. It's great, thank you. And so that um, concludes my presentation today. Um, I want to give a big shout out to the National Science Foundation for rolling with the flexibility theme and supporting us. We really couldn't have done it without that, without them. Um, thank you to Heather Theory of Golden Policy and Research for the very insightful external evaluation this year. Um, we also had the support of over 75 volunteers to make this summer successful in the form of project mentors, career circle guests, um, informational interview volunteers, resume reviewers, um, poster evaluators. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we really, you, you helped propel the students' careers and engagement this summer. Um, staff at UNAVCO, um, our business administration staff who helped make sure the students got paid, HR for helping onboard interns remotely and making sure we have I-9 verification and that we can have them here legally. Um, that was a lot of work on their part, so thank you. Um, and then of course, the biggest thank you goes to the 2020 intern cohort for their, their dedication, their perseverance, their commitment, their passion to learn and grow, and of course their flexibility. <laughs> um, despite many hardships along the way, they all we they stuck it out 100 percent We, you know, no, no one, no one dropped out. <laughs> and so um, we really could not have done it without without them. So cheers to them. And thank you all for coming and, and for your interest today. And if anyone has any more questions, I would say we still have a little time. And if while people are typing, um, I just thought I would call out a couple things that went through in the chat as far as suggestions on successes that people had for. So there was Mozilla Hubs virtual reality for a poster session. Um, hmm. So you can read in there, you know, read. I just wanted to make sure people are thinking to look at it. Other people, you know, someone else was like, yes, we struggled. <laughs> it was a little hard to get more people to interact. Um, and another one that uh, they felt went well was a Google Meet um, that gave some good interaction. So um, hopefully by the time we've all gone to some more <laughs> um virtual meetings by next summer. If we need to do it again, we'll have a better sense for posters yes. <laughs> and presentations. Uh, oh, another one that came in says, um, the UCAR AV team helped out. And so it, you know, even people in other countries were able to attend um, and things like that. So again, feel free to ask any more questions that you, if you have for Kelsey, you can unmute and ask them or um, type as you're comfortable. Uh, hi, Kelsey. Can people hear me? I can, yeah. Um, this is Colin Shaw, Montana State University. And I was wondering um, how the research, you, you focus a lot on kind of the, the career development, the supporting um, content of the, of the program. But how did the actual mentored research internships, how did the content, how, how did that have to be altered? Um, or is your content typically fairly computer uh, based to begin with? So you mean the project, how, did, how were the projects? How, how did the projects, I mean, were, did they have to be changed? Uh, you know, rather than working in a lab, they had to go to a big data analysis or something? Right. So no one worked. No one worked in labs, of course. Um, and then we, instead of having originally the end there. So I'm, I'm going to talk more research recess specific um, there. So typically they work individually. And, and um, so this year we decided that they would go into pairs um, to kind of support each other. So we had to look at the scope of projects that was available and decide which project could be um, looked at by two different students because we didn't want them to look at the exact same thing. We'd hope that they would have 
two different kind of scopes, you know, looking at this, a similar project, but looking at two different sets of data. Um, so that sort of thing. So that's because they, even though they did their colloquium talks together, um, they had separate, they created separate posters. And so that made it easier now when they're submitting abstracts to these conferences that now they're presenting on their own instead of having to do it with a partner. Um, but as far as like the, the, the project scope themselves, I can't talk as much about recess. Um, because I, I didn't work directly with those mentors. Unfortunately, that was Andy, um, but for, for Geo Launchpad, um, so they were both working with the United States Geological Survey. Um, one pair of students um, needed all of the security clearance access and that didn't work. So that um, project had to, had to shift a little bit. So instead of actually looking at the data, they looked at, um, um, uh, standard operating procedures, which kind of sounds a little bit boring, but they were preparing for student contractors to come on um, at the end of the summer. And so there was a lot of, um, they ended up doing a lot of the back end work. And then they actually both got offered the positions for the student contractor position. So it ended up working out and now they're doing the project that they originally were supposed to do. Um, but that was kind of a unique situation. The other Geo Launchpad interns um, were supposed to do a little bit more of a technical project and that project shifted to um, something that could be accommodated um, online a little bit easier. And so they ended up working um, on a mapping project that's actually a like a citizen science project. So a lot of that stuff is already done with people who aren't in person. Um, and so that project totally shifted right once we went remotely, but that's, um, that's another example. All right, maybe I you could do the last couple slides then, Mitchell. And if anyone else has any thinks of any more questions, we could field it right after that. Sure. Uh, go ahead and share. First, thank you, Kelsey, for for joining us today and and sharing with us. This has been a really informative webinar. So we appreciate your time and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, a couple upcoming opportunities. Our next webinar is quasi services for the water education community. And that's on Thursday, November 5. Uh, so we invite you to join us for that webinar. As always, uh, we encourage you to consider your department or course for NAGT's traveling workshops program, which is running virtually now. Um, I've included a link to our Teaching Geoscience Online website where you can find more resources on how to teach in online settings uh, and encourage you to join us next year at the 2021 Rendezvous, which will also be online. And uh, lastly, if you have a couple extra minutes today um, to please complete our webinar evaluation, and I've put a link to that into the chat box, we always appreciate your feedback um, on our webinars. So if you have a few minutes, uh, please do that. Are there any final questions from anyone in the last minute or two? I don't think I see any others in the chat. Mitch, I actually have a really quick question. This is Kelsey yeah. again. Um, well, so since there was a lot of good recommendations in this chat, is it possible to save that? Yeah, I can save the chat and okay. um, and add some of those recommendations to the Thank webinar you. webpage. Thank you. All right, well then with that, thank you again, Kelsey. Thank you, Beth, for your help with watching the chat and moderating the webinar. And thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you at a future event.